Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 790th New Social Environment. Today's event is offered in English and Spanish. So for Spanish, please make sure that you're tuned into the Spanish channel by clicking on the globe icon on the bottom right, where it says interpretation on Zoom. And for English, select the English channel. Buenas tardes. Bienvenido al evento Brooklyn Rail. Este será eh, traducido en inglés y en español simultáneamente. Para aquellos que prefieran escuchar en uno u otro idioma, por favor, en la parte de abajo del Zoom donde dice More o Más, ahí pueden abrir y al lado dice Interpretación, pisan en Interpretación y ahí escogen la lengua en la que ustedes prefieren escuchar este diálogo. Muchas gracias. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at The Rail, and I have the immense pleasure and privilege today of being your MC for a conversation featuring Dario Escobar and Jose Falconi. We are thrilled to welcome poets Maria Argel and Enrique Orang Silva here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Guatemalan-born sculptor Dario Escobar is a contemporary artist whose work is characterized by the formal and conceptual investigation of objects and their insertion into the field of art history and visual art. His work challenges the viewer to reflect on the space we occupy within the social, political, and economic systems that sustain our existence. Over the last two decades, Escobar's art has gained a critical place around the world. Assistant Professor of Art and Human Rights at the University of Connecticut, Jose Falcone received his PhD from Harvard in 2010. From 2001 to 2011, he was Art Forum Curator at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University, curating more than 30 shows of cutting edge Latino and Latin American artists in an academic setting. And we are so thrilled and grateful to have these two amazing people here with us on the NSC. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Jose. Thank you very much. Everybody hears me well. Todos me escuchan bien. Perfectamente. Voy a hablar en español de ahora en adelante. Hablo un poquito de español. Así que, porque soy peruano originariamente. I will speak Spanish from now onwards. I'm original Peruvian. And... I am happy to be here once more. Uh, happy thanks, thanks to everyone, our friends from uh, Bogan Rail, and uh, thank you especially to Chloe. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, even mm, mm, happier because I'm here with Dario once again. He's an old friend. We've been in more than a thousand battles together. And so I'm happy to have him here in New York because he's actually in Mexico and I am in Boston or close to Boston, really. But I am, we're happy to be here and to be able to speak about his ex exhibit in New York. And I would ask him to see if we can start seeing these images can we start seeing these images of the show, which is right now in ex being exhibited in, uh, being shown in, uh, in New York, in the Almine Rec Gallery, the Rio. And I think that this will show uh, many of the things that Rio does and it's a very good way of being able to start 
understanding Darío's uh, work. I'm going to recite a bit of history. How, how, how Darío accessed fame and how has he maintained it uh, since a long time ago, because Darío is one of those artists which have been able to uh, maintain himself since the end of the 90s. That's almost 25 years where he has been, uh, he's been in the major leagues of Latin American art and he's maintained himself there. And this show in New York, it shows clearly that of or how he works and what 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 what's the importance of his work throughout the years why do i say this well there's multiple uh, reasons why i say this the first one has to do with the type of materials that you can find in his work what is this material well it's uh it's uh, it's materials that he he finds. It's uh, there's simple material materials. Darío looks around and finds. He he he, he hasn't uh, manufactured anything. He's rather has searched and and look looked uh, where where around where he is. Uh, in Central America or Mesoamerica. The second thing is, uh, is uh, I would like to speak about is the purpose of this work. That is, there's a first important aspect of this, uh, this materials, of these materials. He works with materials he finds. The second thing is to this material he works he, he grabs it he works it he he adds something he he adds a, a patina he he uh, he adds something to it some paint uh, in this case if if, if you see uh, these uh, these works uh, that we're showing okay this here is related to the history of Baroque, of Latin American Baroque. This uh, golden, golden, um, this golden uh, patina, more than patina, this golden uh, material sends us back to our Latin American, um, Latin American history. These blades of gold or it sends us back to to the times of time of the colony. So this this gold laminate does that. So the third aspect is that in this juxtaposition, Darío also searches for for a way to find or present to us a series of. Um, how would I say a or, or let's say talks about he, he talks about relates clear situations regarding the current time the the current situation of 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 our countries so this is something that we're going to see as well in in this, in a few moments with Dario if we could advance these uh, images a bit more. Why, why is the this show called encrypted messages, ciphered messages? This is the reason. I would like you to see this. We're going to advance a bit more on these. I would like you to stop, to stop and see this image. Let's stop at this image for a moment. This is an image of a of uh, an advertisement as as any any notice in metal but it has three holes 
Okay, it has three holes. Let's go to the next one. Now we can see these bullets are actually, bu these holes are bullet holes, okay? So, so, wow. Bullet holes, exactly, like Mr. Schwartz said in the, in the chat. And Dario, he didn't just take any advertising or any, or any, or any sign. He took this one, which shows us a, a specific issue that we're suffering in the region where he, where he is uh, living. So Dario, let's hear you. Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone involved in this, in this dialogue, especially because I think it is a way of employing information and complement uh, this dialogue with this, uh, the, uh, with this uh, expo in uh, Amin Reich, Heights uh, Gallery. And I think we've had a conversation in the last years in which we have both have, uh, have this dialogue regarding uh, context. And the most interesting thing is what, what does it mean to make art from these places? So that how does this, how is this added to this great let's say universe that is that we call art before i listen to you i'm sorry before i answer your question i would like to start talking a bit regarding the axis of my work throughout these last 25 years and the first of it is, this is the 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 spine of it my work has always been an open dialogue with universal art through these contexts. I've always been interested in this relationship between the colonial period, the official history and history of universal art, how all these contexts come together and create a scenario. Uh, and and it, it, it all flows at the same time somehow. At the beginning of the 90s, I was very interested in Baroque because clearly is the first artistic movement which was global in nature. There is glo Baroque in Guatemala, there is Baroque in Mexico, there is Baroque in, in Baroque in Philippines, Ecuador, everywhere. Baroque was that very first time in which the world is is related amongst itself and it begins and understanding different positions vis-a-vis -vis policies and aesthetics. Starting from there, I, I started to develop these uh, contradicting objects or, or objects that actually, uh, to, with the idea of, uh, of twisted spaces from the first time parts uh, in 98, there were disposable cups, and this culture that was inserted in my country, a country that had just signed uh, peace, and the idea of progress was just the the uh, the notion of of opening to the world. So I take all this trash, and I started taking it into a more complex uh, thing, which is spirituality and what are these new idols that are being created due to these juxtapositions sorry can we see the magn the image of the cup yeah it would be great and starting from this um this uh mise en scene uh this uh i start showing some elements that were start start from the colony, the theatralization, the conversion, the, the new idols to be venerated. So I was always interested in these connections and the idea of, of hierarchies. So I started questioning these structures and, to, and created 
creating historical traps, let's say, because you see, you have the, the, the gold blade that was applied to or gold laminate, which was talk, applied to sculpture in, in the 16th and 17th century in the colonial areas. And I wanted to show this because to, for me, art is to confront the spectator before totally uncongruous situations. Because I think we need to ref reflect over these ideas and reflect on the past, which is still present. And uh, so I started working with, uh, with a story of art, with all these objects that we just um, throw, usually throw away because this was to take it to a more consecrated territory where they're not trash anymore. They're more complex in their semiotic structure and they could be, they can be read differently. Evidently, uh, this was all from a situational space, but all this had something very specific. These were easily recognizable objects, which people would had started to perceive and to consider from another perspective now. So I think from this point of view, this is, this is what made me work on this line and have this open conversation, which generated a lot of things. Just to, just to add one thing, this was the year 1998. This was the year as years when the peace had been signed and the globalization was arriving. But what you were saying with this comment around uh, this uh, Bar McDonald's made Baroque is that there was, uh, the, the concept had arrived before, right? Because Baroque was the first, the first mo glo globalized moment, right? And um, and then secondly, uh, that's a comment that I think is interesting. This is a very 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 this is very this is a comment that can be referred to the to a current moment. Yes 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 yes. Many books arrived to my hands at the end of the 90s, which I thought were very interesting. And I, 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 I went deep into them. And this was precisely when Garcia Canchini was talking about cultural migration and the idea of citizens and consumers. I was always, uh, uh, my studio was always in the historical center of Guatemala. And I saw how it went from an agrarian society to start consuming unnecessary products brought from everywhere, Ch China, Taiwan. And I thought it was interesting to see how Guatemalans perceived progress. So this was precisely that short circuit between two epochs, which were apparently which were apparently opposed, but with the same characteristics, because at this moment I was seeing in Guatemala a same process, except that now it was like a colonizing process, but now the kings or the general captains did not even live in our territories. And we go back to the to the conflict one. Yeah, and stay, thank stay you. There. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Y y pienso que aquí es donde empieza realmente el primer momentum, por así decirlo, de mi trabajo. Al pegar centro en estas ideas que estaban dando vueltas y en proponer una historia que no ha cambiado en 500 años y que es probablemente lo único que cambian son los actores, pero el guión está completamente definido. Uh -huh. Y entonces, a partir de esto, paso directamente, varios años después, a repensar un poco las funciones y las relaciones de las cosas y aparece la serie de mensajes cifrados. Uh -huh. Y esta serie, precisamente, es la que está exponiéndose en este momento en la Galería de Alvin Reich en Nueva York, 
Y es una serie que parte precisamente de esa conexión con la historia y con todos estos elementos que se están articulando entre sí. Para podemos, empezar... Podemos ir de nuevo a la, a, la primera, a, a, la, a la primera imagen, a las primeras imágenes. Claro, a las primeras imágenes de la exposición. Uh -huh. Cuando vengo a México y decido... Bueno. I'm so sorry uh, to interrupt. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Heidi, the translator, is in the Spanish channel. Heidi, can you move to the English channel, please, for interpretation? Thank you. Sorry. Please continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Can we go Thank back you. to the first image? Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Super. Great. Mm -hmm. Entonces, cuando vengo a México, me encuentro el trabajo de muchos artistas que trabajaron eh, prácticamente con esta idea de empezar a percibir las cosas desde otro sentido. Y me encontré con el trabajo de Matías Geritz, que es un artista al que me parece muy interesante entrar en sus dinámicas y en sus pensamientos, uh -huh. sobre todo cuando propone la idea de lo emocional dentro de la estructura artística. Uh -huh. Él tiene una serie de obras que son grandes placas de metal con orificios pequeños que él distribuye alrededor formando composiciones. Él a esto le llama mensajes cifrados. Uh -huh. Es una serie que desarrolló a partir de los años finales de los 50 y terminó prácticamente cuando él muere en los 80. Me pareció muy interesante lo que significaba, lo que él decía, esa idea de estos mensajes que no podemos entender. Sorry, Heidi, Heidi, you are still in the Spanish channel. Can you please switch over to the English channel uh, so that you don't override the, the conversation in the Spanish channel? Thank you. So sorry to interrupt again, Dario. Okay. No, it's, it's okay, perfect. Continue. Entonces, eh, me interesó muchísimo esas conexiones que él hace, a, eh, sobre todo la idea de estos mensajes que no podemos entender. Desde hace más de 15 años empecé a coleccionar estos letreros que encontraba desde México hasta Guatemala, en donde todos estaban impactados por palas. Me pareció muy interesante ver cómo la poética y la violencia podían convivir en un mismo espacio y se me ocurrió relacionar estos letreros con orificios con los mensajes cifrados de Matías Guedes. En estas obras, en realidad, lo que me interesaba era proponer cómo esta violencia que está normalizada en nuestros territorios forma parte de unos códigos que nadie puede entender, pero al mismo tiempo podemos comprender. Un balazo en un letrero puede ser desde un aviso de un pandillero por no pagar el derecho de piso, hasta un grupo de amigos tomando una cerveza en la esquina practicando tiro al blanco sobre los letreros. Uh -huh. Me pareció muy interesante cómo esa normalización de la violencia generaba otros códigos de conducta, porque... Creo que mi trabajo, a primera vista, siempre es un trabajo que puede llegar a seducirte, pero cuando tú empiezas a abrir estas capas, aparecen lecturas más complejas y probablemente... Probably, it generates a error where you can see, which can be refracted thought, what you would feel. And this series is... Oh, based to these initial readings where I was doing an analogy and of Getty's uh, work and how this idea of the shots, of the messages that we don't understand are transparent and they give us these works that seem distant cousins, but at the end are really They're a very similar line where we can see the historical connotation with the violence of uh, that uh, Montana used to allude to, and also to try to to hide the misery of the material um, with the shine of uh, gold. Why the, the radical and very perfect geometrical work? Look, this is an idea, a very personal idea, and it's a personal uh, 
I've always said that I, I appreciate history of art. And there was something that I thought was very interesting taking into consideration the history of my country, Guatemala. In Guatemala, we have fantastic painters like Merida, who he was the great geometric uh, artist, but in Guatemala City, he never uh, such success, especially because there was a lot of resistance. People kept producing uh, Baroque works of art in the 1940s, uh, imitating the glorious times, the uh, and King's uh, era. And I wanted to do something that was out of trust. And I thought it would be uh, uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to have these signs behave as uh, geometric figures of the 30s, 40s, 60s. And I thought it was interesting to make them uh, coincide with the lines around them uh, with the shots to to bring up to bring up the the violence. Interesting to put the modern uh, modern time all or that was so. I wanted to create a chaotic with lines that try to hide something, but they they are revealing it. The more they try to hide it the more revealing they are. And it was what I really wanted. And I always, I was always interested in that uh, relationship with the Baroque. Now we all talk about colonialism, but 25 years ago, there was a lot of interest about that. There were artists like uh, Driana Banjao that worked uh, some fantastic work uh, with that idea of how, uh, how West goes into into the the scene and how new ways of understanding the world uh, arise. Darío, you are one of the first that works this type. You are one of the first artists, uh, contemporary artists, with that with that word of contemporary within uh, Central America, uh, Latin America, and specifically Central America. What has, what has the, have these 25 years meant to you? Now you are probably in one of the most vibrant cities in, in the world, in art, uh, Mexico City. What has it meant these 25 years? What have they meant in your as a career with so many books? I worked with Darío. Uh, from different angles. I think we have to take into consideration the and the, the the beginning for the artists that come from uh, Central America, we can't forget the work of artists like Luis Gonzalez Palma, like Moises Barrios, even going a little bit further down, like Luis Diaz, further back, who generated ideas and questions. Our friend, the author. Dallas, he spoke about something that I always thought was very pertinent. That Guatemala sadly has the most terrible data in what has to do with violence, but that in a something Guatemala has always been at the same level of uh, major cities, and that is the making of literature and of the arts. And I remember perfectly how we both used to say, how can we understand this? We have Nobel Prize winners for literature. Liter literature. We have international artists 
justify the existence of these cultural reactions in function of a country, how do they say in in uh, third world country? Uh, and there is an effervescence in places like these. History does not start in, uh, with the have cities that were had the capacity to produce one of the five cultures, civilization, that, that were able to transfer their uh, thoughts into the written language. That's something interesting that we can understand the context to Honduras, where Mesoamerica developed with about 25 million people created its demise. We're talking about cities of uh, producers of knowledge. So I think that now it is true. I think in some, I start with uh, the word of contemporary, but I think that this production is part of the essence of the country. These cities are always generating thought. They are always generating doubts, and they are always especially uh, generating answers. Today, Guatemala has a, a artistic production totally stimulating, and the opening, the format to the thought and the conceptual art has made that indigenous artists Everywhere. As a matter of fact, it's being collected by great uh, art collections where they are uh, including this voice that was missing. They they were able to, and we we and I include myself to open this path so that uh, there is more movement within a perimeter of consequences. Everything is reacted to everything. Today was not the end of a purpose, of a popular purpose, but it's the, the consequence of many pasts, many connections, trying to create what we call today Guatemala. And of your work, Ben, one of the interesting things, and I would like to go back on in the formal part, I want to talk about a uh, very interesting formal part, and we return to the McDonald's Cup, uh, go back to these, these signs, and I go back to, to the whole I have an object that it's almost deteriorated. I don't know how you, how this cup can be conserved. Well, I can tell you that plastic has 500 years of uh, life, 500 years without deteriorating. Yes, but of course I go to the fact that the, the, the signs, they are, they're about, they're, they're corroded and nevertheless corroded has as a as a has a beautiful uh, a perfect geometric covering that is what creates that beautiful effect a geometry a perfect geometry erosion of the reality at the same time uh, what I see is that it's beautiful in which what you have is an object uh, which on one side is real and I have to say that if we're going to talk about the form and the technical part, I had, I studied uh, 
and conservation. And that allowed me to arrive at the objects and apply uh, practically a stopping of their deterioration process. So, but you know how to do that. Yes, yes, for example, the, the signs. And these, these objects, pieces, the initial pieces uh, that I use at the beginning have to stop their deteriorating process. And that is done when it's metal. Line B78, with that, the pieces do not continue their corrosion process, and that's where I can start working with them. In the work that I'm doing now, I really am interested in the history of the object, how it was uh, doing something, and then we go with the exchange value. When this value is not ut ut utilizable normally, and it's and it's and it's transmitted into the artistic I think that's a, that are more defined by the garbage row than what the objects they use. And in that exercise, I am really interested in returning to life from another dimension, from another perspective, and being able to show and and cancel that utility and give it a more why at this moment a sign that should be thrown into the garbage has a value value because it is holding the reactions the thought the intention of a society and i think through this is where it starts this second life my i think that in reality i i prefer to send these objects so they have many perceptions many readings and that the construction of the work is complex than working directly reproducing or recreating the situations i am not uh, very interested in illustrating things i think art is reading a complex lecture that has a capacity of returning you towards aspects that you wouldn't have seen. and if it hadn't been because of that that point of view tell me a bit about how how do you accumulate so many you know that i'm compulsive you know me you know i'm compulsive yes there is some compulsivity uh, wounds from uh, from growing up. Um, and I was very happy when I found out that people, when people who, who buy those, when they have uh, shots or, 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 you know, they don't want them, but not me. On the contrary, they make them much more interesting. And I started to collect them and when when all the salesmen and salespeople in the markets met me, they would they would save them for me because those didn't have a a value public that they sell to. So I started to put them together. Then I found a great piece with uh, from Matias Geritz uh, at the Museum of Monterrey from the 70s, probably. And it was where I made the connection between the holes, the bullet holes, and and uh, um, that is where I made the connection to see how. Y creo que lo que más me interesó de ese ejercicio fue que. And I think that what uh, I needed to do the most. Uh, or, or the most important, related, important thing related to this exercise was the fact that I, of my work about as an artist was to rescue this object 
and uh, apply this perfect gold leaf that uh, reminds us of all these uh, things about El Dorado, all this, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, all this like in the States, the, the gold fever. So I thought that this same operation that the Baroque, uh, Baroque um, sculptures did, they covered their art with the splendor of gold. And this reminds me that you had, um, you had, uh, you had had in your, uh, in your, in your work, moments of violence that you can see in Dario's books that are like bumpers. They're basically, uh, uh, they're actually literal bumpers. Uh, and they're basically, you know, the, the front part of a car, which has, uh, which has had a, an accident, right? And basically what Dario does is that when he gets these bumpers, um, he gets the part, the front part of these cars, which is uh, completely destroyed because of the violence of the cra crash. And he, he re crumbs it. That is the sculpture is, is made starting from the violence of the impact itself. Very similar to, to like keeping these holes uh, of the bullet holes. And on these sides, once more, what you do is you simply you simply pick up the um, the what you might call it the object you found, right? Just as it is as it is, and what gives it a form is the violence uh, done upon the object, right? It's the same thing with ourselves. Uh, Jose, it's uh, those, uh, I mean, these impacts that life has given us is what conforms us, you know, it's just as if you're a sculpture and, and, and you receive the hits uh, to, to be given a form. So these bumpers are very important for us. And you're, you're talking about, well, we're talking about the two series I, de I developed in Mexico, the one about the signs with bullet holes and the ones about bumpers. The, the, this bumper was something that was very interesting and pertinent and definitely made sense in Mexico due to the volume of the city and the vehicular traffic that it has. When I was on the road, I, see, I saw such a number of huge accidents. And, you know, that started me thinking these bumpers that are used to avoid bigger harm is what will actually harm the, the drivers and the cars the most. So I started thinking, the, the, this crash, this impact, uh, really has, makes a lot of sense in thinking about art, because when you extract this bumper before the impact and put chrome on it, as when it came out of the factory, it was a way of incorporating its history within the element, element and its it's a way to rethink about violence and poetry in the same space, the same format is like poetry itself. Um, it's a way in which you can go into difficult, uh, difficult situations from a different contemplation point of view. Magnificent, uh, Dario, magnificent. Um, I think, uh, Claudia is saying that we want your questions to be in the chat, but we'll continue talking. But yes, yeah, start putting your, your questions there because after a while, we'll start, uh, we'll start uh, going into these questions. I wanted to go into this series, which is called Table Games, which is not in the exhibit, but this is the last thing you've been working on. And it shows to me your ease and transforming any kind of object into some kind of, of, of symbol, abstract language. These are tables. Yes, these are folding tables. Yes, folding tables that you have at home, but you turn them around, you re, 
you're re you're showing us uh, these from a different perspective. It's uh, tell us about this. Well, right now I'm I'm focusing on this series, and it's a continuity, obviously, on uh, on the signs because these tables, which are used by by taco shops, by restaurants, uh, beer joints, kind of a popular thing which we all know about, and they were also part of, uh, let's say, kinds of interesting situations because there was one that had a bullet hole, right? And uh, so I liked this exercise of form, of continuity, which was a way to dialogue openly, as with the signs, it, it's a continuation of this concept and playing again with these exercises of form of aggression and also of uh, also a way of starting to think about again on everything that I've thought about in a in a in a multi-dimensional format. But you it, you you go back to minimalism, right? Well, it's curious. For many years ago. I had uh, the supremacist manifesto of Malevich, and I read it, and I thought it was very curious, very pertinent, because Malevich, in his manifest, he affirms that Western culture has reached such a level of sophistication that it doesn't need to copy reality, but rather or create reality from its out of itself and this is this was written like 110 years ago approximately uh, and that's when the supremacist art becomes but i think his observation is imprecise because cultures in in latin america the inca maya olmeca cultures they had a, a very Prox, a very close relationship with abstraction. It was a day-to-day -day relationship with this. We can we can appreciate it in in uh, in textiles, in ceramics. Uh, these abstraction exercises were not invented in Russia in 1913. They have uh, occurred in the past. Uh, and we can see it in everything that survived from these cultures. And I thought it was interesting to make these annotations. And that's why I have uh, worked towards uh, resolving my work from a more geometric point of view, more abstract point of view. I feel more comfortable with this thought. Also probably uh, because my my formal studies were as an architect. So these abstract thoughts are not uh, alien to me, but it's it's actually uh, it's comfortable. You know, it's like Spanish and not English. I feel I feel more familiar. I, I, I'm more comfortable with the words that I use and the relationship with ideas with ideas. No doubt. But there is something that I find interesting here that I see uh, this this um, this uh, I, I want to call it the this kind of everyday uh, uh, how ordinary these tables could be uh, and uh, one could you know this confidence, you just turn around any of these tables and then you have an abstract uh, work of art. It's, well, here we go into what uh, uh, what our friend, uh, our friend uh, Santa Teresa de Avila used to say, you know, you need to perform ordinary actions in an extraordinary way. Well, that's part certainly of all your poetry somehow, that is to find in the most ordinary object, a very potent comment. Well, I mean, tell me what is in, is in this, what literature does, what all art does, you tr it transforms all 
life, all experience, everything ordinary takes it and takes it into a more complex exercise, a more complex perception exercise. And that's where you have find you find something marvelous, which we human beings have, which is sensitivity. I think at the end, something that I've always looked for is this complicity of sensibilities. Uh, that most of my friends are writers and uh, because I've always been interested in all this exercise, making all this life experience that goes beyond simple suffering or, or even ha just simple happiness. Uh, it's an experience that, that go, takes us beyond ordinary formats and it takes us to more complex uh, places which turn, make your sight turn around towards aspects that if you had not had these sources, you would not have paid attention twice to them. Yes, yes, no doubt uh, that good art and good literature do that to you. It's not just in, in any art. And I think that's where that's that's where the grace, the magic is, uh, where you can find this this uh, this this magic again into these very simple, ordinary objects. You know, this seems to come out of of nothing yet. It is a statement, a clear statement. Um, to start closing, because you only have like five minutes for us together, and then we have to open this for the public. Um, I would like to. I would like. Can we go back to the first images? The first images of this show. So we start. Let's close with the with the beginning. I would like us to talk about this. This uh, image of uh, image of four perfectly of these uh, signs. Let me say this: no, I don't want to talk about the separate works of art, but rather the choreography, the whole exhibition, the concept. How how did you how did you assemble this? And what is it that you felt in order to assemble this choreography? Well, the truth is, I like this word choreographer, choreography more than museography. Um, I really tried to use these uh, these uh, works that have connection with traditional geometry. For example, these four elements that form this sort of like an X. I made a, a clear uh, a clear connotation with Malevich's black cross, because I thought it was a way to start the conversation to all these stories from Central America and Mexico towards the rest of the world connected through the story of universal art through pure forms. Really, this choreography, as you're, as you're calling it, is a connection between geometrical forms, which are juxtaposed with with popular advertising signs. I've always been interested, Jose, in this connection, especially how you determine what is what has a high registry and what is popular and how this conforms culture. This these connections have always seemed very important to me. They have always seemed pertinent to me. Uh, and uh I think that is if if we want to show different ways of showing things, we need to draw these archaic concepts over these social constructs, which are whatever is uh, popular and and whatever is uh, let's say um, on the on the other hand. Uh, cult uh, or or high level, and I think this doesn't have a lot of somehow. Uh, we we again we have this kind of uh, contradiction nowadays, and this choreography was made with these pure linear forms, which are somehow related, and these are basic forms, and this is something that distracts because what I want is to 
grab the attention of the spectator and allow the spectator to discover all the ciphered messages that are there, all those stories that that both the spectator and me are never going to know, but they're part of our of our, of what appear in our imagination and take us to new ways of re, of of relating one to another. And the most important thing is how to uh, think, uh, and I want to highlight this, how can, how violence and poetry live together, one next to the other. Perfectly, perfectly. Well, we're almost hitting 2 p.m. and it's the, time, the moment to open this to questions. I have one question from, oh, I cannot see the questions. You read them to me, okay? Perfectly. Yeah, thank Chloe, you. Chloe, should I read the question I, I'm from gonna, Mr. Schwartz? I'm, I'll help out with the Q&A here. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dario and Jose, and to our translators for this incredible, incredible dialogue. It's been so great to hear about this body of work and to hear about your practice, Dario. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience today, and our first question will be from GE, and GE, you should be able to ask directly. Thank you so very much, Eleanor, and thank you so much for bringing and taking the time with your work today, Dario. Thank you. Say, for hosting. My question is, is your aim of transforming these found objects through an almost alchemical process? to make powerful metaphors for the proposition that all growth, cultural and spiritual, is additive and subtractive? Well, I think it, that, that connection is very important for me. The connection between the story of the object, the, the patina that time gives it, and this new life I'm giving it. I think the first phase, is to stop uh, stop it from decomposing because from the moment that the object is said its message it's it said it now I have to combine this with another structure and make it talk from a different perspective i think that part for me is very important thank you thank you ge for that question thank you for the question um, I, I would like to ask a question, Dario. Um, I'm wondering if how the work, how your work and its themes are received differently in the U.S. versus in Guatemala or in other South American countries or other countries where you show your work. Okay, this is a fantastic question. I think that Las respuestas de los contextos siempre tienen sus propias historias como antecedentes. Mostrar mi trabajo en Nueva York generó respuestas y preguntas diferentes a las respuestas y preguntas que genera en América Latina. And generated different questions to the questions that I asked in other places, but they are all related within each other. I think being at the end is just one. They are all absolutely in the same direction, but I think that these pieces have the ability of speaking about all these things that from another place they couldn't. I think to begin in both contexts, we can think as as bringing uh, meaning. We, I had a I had a show in in Dina, in Denmark, and the people were uh, um, very emotional and, and very scared because of the gunshots. 
And I thought it was very interesting because then I did uh, open studios in my Mexico studio and many people spoke to me, oh yeah, you have to look for more signs in this city because they're much aggressive and they have more um, gunshots. And so it's very interesting to see how the perceptions of the public are related very much about their personal context. For a Danish, uh, they've never seen a gun in their life. But in Mexico, it's very, they're very familiar with that exercise. And I think that the perspectives are always uh, ample. They're different, but they don't far away from the main idea of the project. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. No, gracias a ti. Um, Thank you. Other question? So we have a question. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Um, but we do have our a question from Fong right now. Yeah. You should Thank, be you. Thank you so much, Dario. Thank you, Jose, for Thank you for your conversation. Um, you know, uh, this very, uh, vi this visionary painter who I admire so much, his name is Alfred Jensen. He was actually born in Guatemala City, um, the turn of the century, I think it's 1903, and somehow went on to study with Hans Hartmann uh, in Munich before Hoffman moved to New York in uh, the early 30s. But in any rate, he traveled extensively, he read quite widely, and then finally moved to New York in early 50 and couldn't fit in the whole New York school, the after expressionist. But it was, I would say, you know, late in his life, maybe late 50, early 60, that he had discovered having just, you know, reading everything that he grew up, his memory of his youth in Guatemala, you know, the hieroglyphic Maya calendar patterns and columns, so on, that really transformed him to reach his own maturity as a mature style late in life. Um, it, my question is similarly applied to certain people. I kept quoting Maurice Flamac, who once said that intelligence is international, stupidity is national, and art is local. Mm -hmm. It's very funny. And I know that in my own, you know, visit to my own co old country, Vietnam, for example, I remember in my youth, that to buy a Coca-Cola will cost like 10 times cost of drinking natural coconut water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that it's all have changed now. Yeah. But, you know, so I'm thinking about in the context of your own abstraction, the uses, I agree, that is already in your own culture long ago. Uh, but I'm thinking about re the idea of recycling, redeployment, being mindful of also Western art and invention. So the idea of, for example, uh, minimalism, do you know? Yeah. So how, how do you mediate minimalism along your own mindfulness of the question of consumption, waste and environment? environmental awareness or mindfulness? Paula, tu pregunta es una pregunta y una... Your question is a very pertinent question with very pertinent notes. I think it's very complex to explore in depth all the directions that you have uh, mentioned, but I think it's very interesting to analyze these precepts in relation to the all the information that we receive all the time in what relates to the success in 
relation to a a conduct of uh, success and what it implies. For example, Guatemala, after the uh, signature of uh, peace, the peace accord started to open and it was invaded by objects without too much sense that were on the streets and that proposed the idea of a country, a uh, developed country. And it's we started to see many objects like uh, scooters. Uh, scooters started to to uh, be available in the 80s, and the kids of my of my age, I was a youngster. We we played with uh, bicycles, and some of them had um, scooters, but not too many because they were dangerous. And then in the 90s, at the end of the 90s, when the markets opened and all the negotiations, Guatemala started to be invaded by objects that proposed a status, a different status to this idea of a provincial life in Guatemalan. And everybody started to, to buy what implied a social status. People would go to eat to McDonald's because that implied being cool and and they started to have a different type of relationship with the cultures that were proposing that were proposing a tv in the in the uh, records in the uh, movies and it was a way of being on you start to see a transculturist transculturation, and it's very interesting because we can see it negatively, but on the other side, we can see something very interesting, and it's that, like you you said it, it's local, that uh, these things become local, because at the end, these are ingredients that enter their repertoire, and they are not assimilated as, as they are, but they are simple ingredients, cultural ingredients that show up and they don't really um, pick out the culture. Something that is very interesting for me from Mexico is that in Mexico, the, the food chains, the fast food chains are very few. People keep going to eat the taco sales where they sell tamales and you see the tacos and everybody's there and you go to the fast food restaurants and you see that there's uh, some people, but not so many. Um, but even though they've tried, those uh, restaurant uh, chains have tried, they haven't uh, been able to because people prefer to go to the taco stay, uh, to, to buy uh, taco. They're going to have more uh, tortillas. So I think it's how the world is sharing this uh this card game at the end of the game uh, advert is the one who deals the cards and the one that takes it is one and and each one has control over their own uh hand of cards but i don't know if uh no 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 i mean if uh, jose has a comment i think the question was very interesting no 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 i think It's precisely, you know, he, he he is a one of the great artists of precisely this particular juncture, you know, of the particular junctures of um, this sort of hybridity, and mm -hmm. making a comment of particularly this type of um, uh, mixed signs, you know, in which you know you do not know where where you know one thing. I mean, where does um, I mean, look at I mean the the, the McDonald's uh, cup, the the the, the cornflakes um, with with the Baroque signs, you know, and all the other work that you have been doing, you know, for over these years, you know, do do I mean actually, oh, it's spoken English. Is that okay? I guess. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's fine. I guess. Um, my friend. Um. Um. But that's that's precisely. Um. I mean, those are basically signs that you know. I mean, th these are these are 
works of art that you know that show this conflation of all these different layers in which he's working, all these repertoires in which he's working, you know, in yeah. which one particular thing has all these different registers. Um, these are these are objects at a crossroads, always, you know, that show, you know, where is Guatemala situated, you know, in 1998, you know, and they make a very unique comment. Globalization did not start there. You know, it started in the Baroque period. It started 500 years ago. No. You know, um, um, those bullets, you know, you know, say something particular. They're a comment about violence. Mm -hmm. You know, these are not objects that are like, you know, appropriated just for no reason or just decorative reason. They're actually making a very specific comment about probably political violence or a very particular comment about geopolitical realities that we need to face in Latin America. No, fantastic. I veo que hay uh, varias preguntas de GE. I see pregunta. that there's some, uh, a few questions, uh, one from GE. Okay, oh. oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, the Thank next you. step, okay. Thank you for that question, Fong, that was great. Um, I will now read something that Erica wrote in the chat. Um, yep. Perhaps you can respond. Sí. Um, oh. Puedes conversar de la transición de los artículos deportivos a los sí. materiales con una conversación político-social de México, al igual que la relación entre ambos. Relationship tipos? between both. Fantástica pregunta. Great eh, al final, los objetos Big deportivos. question. At the end, uh, sports. Uh, objects have the same connotations that the images, um, advertising images that I'm working with right now, the object, the uh, sports objects um, were of my interest because of the context uh, in, in places like my country, Guatemala, I was about the po political, about uh, victory and defeat in the same place, how this defined the the new societies, the contemporary societies, and how this extra being the winner was very important in the making of the, uh, the, the view of success. Um, there was a dramatic view of being uh, an object of sport or also a, a duality and I think that my my work with these sports objects always had a connotation related to violence, because for me it was violent to see how in the games, in the soccer games, or America, there was aggression, constant aggression, and there was a, 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 a there was a an idea of what was success and what was defeat. I, with my work, I wanted to create sculptures where there were no losers or winners. There were people playing in a different way. And the game was simply to be, we can figure these codes and rethink all these spaces, but always violence has been a fundamental point in my work that has and consequently, in relation to the objects that I choose to be able to speak about it, I think that when I was younger, I was more related with these objects, with these sports objects, because of different reasons, but especially because my studio was close to a factory uh, where they, the falls, the, the, I would like to get these football soccer that were fake and all these things that were in these new economies, these transactions that probably I, I try to work in these exercises from a very seductive uh, way. I really enjoyed this, a seduction to get attention. Now, 
with the time I have been less, I've become less of a seductor and I am becoming more vocalized. And now I am maybe not so interested in these exercises of objects produced in great amounts. I, I, I have more interest in these historical objects and, and stories that one, one can build. And I think it's a different way. It's another way to see the same in a different, from a different angle. And Thank you, Dario and Erika. I think our final question will be from Veronica. You should be able to mute. Sí, Darío, tengo una pregunta sobre la, el mundo. I have a question about the world, textiles and that come from Guatemala, and I think it's beautiful, the, the folklore part, and I would like to know if these pieces could be in an art gallery. My question is about the, the wonderful handicrafts and uh, the folklore of Guatemala, the textiles, and if those yeah. could ever be placed in an interesting perspective in a gallery of art? Yeah, it's a, it's una super buena pregunta. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, just a minute ago, we spoke about how we define limit being the, the educated and the popular. And I think that from Chiapas to Guatemala, including Oaxaca, there's a fantastic uh, amount of people who work with textiles uh, in a pretty much a mathematical way. When you see a textile, you see mathematics to pure mathematics. And it's interesting um, to find these connotations and how they, they have content at the same time because a lot of uh, people are, are related with codes that repeat uh, throughout their, their, their designs that mean something. And I really, it's, it's very complicated today to, to make these differences, but for me, any manifestation that has a, as an intention to trans to make us see the world in a different way, definitely can be considered uh, a work of art. Thank you for your question. Gracias, Veronica. Gracias, Dario and Jose, again. Um, we have a tradition here at the rail of concluding our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poets of the day, Maria Argel and Enrique Orang Silva to the stage. Maria Argel grew up in Monte Libano, a town in the Colombian Caribbean coast. She studied literature in Bogota and is now attending the master's program in creative writing in Spanish at NYU. She writes poetry and fiction and is currently working on her first novel. And Enrique Orang Silva is an architect, writer, and translator. He has edited design and literary magazines and is chief editor at kuzark.com. Kuzark Apart from drawing, plans and writing short stories. He translates literary text at Versiones Press. Muchas gracias for being here today, Maria and Enrique, and over to you. Hola, buenas tardes, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Elinor and every, everybody here. Um, voy, a, voy a leer de una vez, pero antes quiero saber si está el sonido listo, si todo está... Ok, sí, ok, bueno. Muchas gracias, Darío. Eh, ha sido muy interesante gracias, escuchar sí. esta charla y José. Eh, yo quise escribir un poema. To write a poem based. Y lo titulé de la misma manera. Named it the same. Entonces aquí es. Oh, here it is. Mensaje cifrado. Tengo el recuerdo de una ruta pueril polvorienta con reverso de oro. Los hierbajos y las personas de la orilla percudidos. Las familias en moto escondidas en pañolones blancos percudidos. Sus reversos eran de oro. Los refrescos en esa ruta estaban siempre calientes y la cara del loro en los paquetes de yupi se había velado por el olvido. 
Quizá el reverso de la puerilidad en esas rutas era siempre de oro. Quizá había manchas que transcurrían perfectas por encima de aquella ruta familiar y semanal, superpuestas a cualquier curvatura o bache, manchas inmaculadas por sobre las manos de mi madre que iba en el asiento delantero pelando naranjas para su desayuno, por sobre el estuche de los CDs y de las canciones allí grabadas, villancicos, vallenatos, manchas de oro paralelo, transversales al sueño, al calor, a la rasquiña en el cuello, a los residuos de yupis en las comisuras de mis labios. Oro omnipresente, cuando llegábamos al patio de la casa de mi abuela, estaba en el balón de cuero. Se manifestaba como una pequeña hemorragia de metal, como un ojo dorado, pupila contenida sobre pellejo. Nos veía jugar. El fusilado era nuestro juego favorito. Sobre la tierra escribíamos nuestros nombres y llevábamos la puntuación. Jugábamos descalzos. La circunferencia de oro era tan intacta sobre el balón que parecía más bien un haz de luz que venía del cielo, incapaz de percudirse como nuestras pantorrillas. Lo pateábamos, nos golpeábamos con él, lo lanzábamos al cielo, caía en charcos si había llovido. El oro ileso, magnífico, no tenía nada que ver con lo que estaba pasando y sin embargo estaba ahí oro, todo entrañas de oro. Si hubiéramos abierto el balón, todo el tuétano dorado nos habría espantado oro. Nos llamaban a almorzar. El balón en medio del patio quedaba mirando al sol, oro caliente. Hacíamos la siesta, nos olvidábamos un rato, oro. Quizá había trazos paralelos de oro en aquellos viajes dominicales. Quizá no lo veía, pues se escondía al reverso, en la parte oculta de la hierba en la que miraba de frente a la sombra, quizá era muy ingenua, yo, oro, y la refulgencia era más bella que cualquier otra cosa. Gracias. Ok, uh, thank you uh, one more time to Chloe, Claroline, Elinor and Darío and Jose for the for the talk and thank you to Maria for the invitation to translate one of her beautiful poems. I'm gonna now read a translation of Maria's verses. <clears throat> Encrypted messages. I have memories of a puerile dusty road with a gold back. The weeds and the people on the roadside soiled. Families on motorcycles, hidden under big white shawls, soiled. Their backs were gold. Sodas on that road were always warm, and the parrot's face on Yuppie's wrappers faded away due to oblivion. Perhaps the back of childhood on those roads was always gold. Perhaps there were stains flawlessly flowing over that weekly and familiar road, overlapping any curve or pothole, immaculate stains above my mother's hands, who used to sit up front, peeling oranges for breakfast above the city wallet case and the songs recorded there, Christmas carols, vallenatos, parallel gold stains, perpendicular to sleep, to heat, to the neck itch, to the UP's remnants on the corners of my mouth. Omnipresent gold. When we arrived at the patio inside my grandmother's house, it was on the leather soccer ball. It showed itself as a small metallic bleed, like a golden eye, contained pupil over skin, watching us play. The executed was our favorite game. On the dirt, we wrote our names and kept score. Barefoot we played. The gold ring on the ball remained so bright, it resembled more a beam of light, unable to be soiled, unlike our calves. We kicked it, struck each other with it, threw it up into the sky, watched it plummet into puddles when it rained. The gold intact 
magnificent, nothing to do with what was happening. And yet, it was their gold. It's God's all gold. If we had opened the ball, its golden core would have scared us, gold. They called us for lunch. In the middle of the patio, the ball gazed at the sun, scorching gold. We napped, forgot, for a moment, gold. Perhaps there were parallel traces of gold on those Sunday rides. Perhaps I didn't see it, hidden in the back, in the secret part of grass, looking at the shadow in the eye. Perhaps very naive I was, gold, and nothing was more splendid than the brightness. Wow, thank you so much, Enrique and Maria. That was so beautiful and such a perfect, perfect way to wrap up this conversation. Um, thank you so much again, Dario and Jose, for the incredibly generous dialogue. And thank you, Heidi and John, for your translation services. And thank you, Adriana and the team at Alman Reich Gallery for their support and sponsorship of today's event. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for supporting our growing archive, where you can view this conversation in English and Spanish on the Rails YouTube channel shortly. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. So please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with James, Clara, and Barbara Pollock on the event of By Force of Nature on U.S. Silverlands, New York. We will conclude tomorrow with a reading by Farnaz Fatemi. And thanks to all of you for joining us um, this afternoon. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you again for being here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Gracias. 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 Gracias.